Uh, it's uh, just after 11 o'clock. We do have a pretty full agenda today, so uh, we will uh, get started right on time. Uh, welcome to everybody for our uh, first, hopefully not annual, virtual ESPA annual meeting. Uh, we've always met in either Albany or Schenectady for uh, many decades, as most people on, uh, on this meeting are aware of. Uh, for those of you that are not or are new to us because we are virtual or just new because you're new to the uh, organization, uh, we do usually hold this in either Albany or recent years in Schenectady, uh, usually either the first, uh, first or second Saturday in March. So uh, because of COVID, obviously, we are not doing that this year. We do plan to head back to Schenectady for our uh, annual meeting next March. Uh, also, uh, Bruce Becker will be handling any of the technical issues and we'll be watching the uh, Q&A. So if um, there is anything, uh, any problems or any hiccups, uh, we will either reboot or I will talk to Bruce to get people's video back, especially as it relates to, uh, to the speakers. Uh, everything seems to be uh, going fine uh, for the last few minutes. We just did a test and uh, everything seems to be going good for um, for handling everything and for everybody being able, to, being able to see everything. So thanks to Bruce for handling the uh, technical part of this. And uh, thanks to everybody for attending today. Um, <clears throat> one thing, we will be having one break. It'll be around 12.45, uh, just before we have um, Tim Kennedy speak at one o'clock. So that will be about a 15 or 20 minute break at 12.45. Uh, the speakers will be done by 2 p.m. Uh, after 2 p.m., uh, we will have a few items for ESPA business, and uh, then we will open it up to questions and answers for a period of time, depending on uh, how much um, how much time we have. We do have to finish around 2.30ish, but uh, we will open it up after that and after the speakers are done for uh, any general questions and answers for uh, for the ESPA ESPA officers. Uh, one sad thing to report, um, our Suffolk County coordinator, Don Nymphius, unfortunately passed away last weekend. Uh, those of us that have been attending the uh, every other month meetings in Schenectady knows that he has not, uh, not been in them for uh, even before COVID. He missed uh, the one right before COVID and then he was not at our annual meeting last year. Uh, Don has been an active member for uh, many decades and uh, being the Suffolk County coordinator, he has helped out tremendously in meeting uh, various people out there to uh, increase uh, Long Island Railroad service. And I must say he was also uh, one of the strong advocates to get some of the uh, east End commuter service on the east end of Long Island. As a matter of fact, I'm honestly, don't, I don't believe that would have started up if it hadn't been for his tenacity and phone calls and meeting people. I had gone out there for a couple of meetings with him and um, <clears throat> all the people involved and the officials uh, knew him well. And he certainly helped to uh, improve, um, improve Long Island Railroad service throughout the year and also came to um, all of our meetings in Schenectady, both of our officer meetings and your annual meetings over the years. So it will be a, a loss to um, <clears throat> to not have Don, but if we could just have a, a moment of silence for uh, Don Nymphius, who uh, passed away last weekend as our Suffolk County Coordinator. Okay. Um, also, just uh, Don Nymphys' funeral is actually occurring right now as we are holding this meeting. So it's pretty ironic that uh, during our annual meeting is exactly when they happen to uh, to have the funeral. He will uh, <clears throat> he will be actually, although he's lived most of his life in Suffolk County, apparently his parents are originally from Westchester County. So he's actually, uh, the funeral is actually taking place uh, right now down in White Plains where he will be buried. So that's the uh, sad news of the meeting. Uh, now I would like to get to uh, some of the more happy news. This, there's been a lot of uh, very positive news lately. Uh, obviously coming out of COVID has been a, a difficult situation for any type of transportation since there hasn't really been, uh, everyone's been told not to travel, uh, quarantine if you go anywhere and all of this, but it looks like with the vaccinations, we're starting to uh, come out of COVID. So um, uh, that's uh, certainly something positive that we will hear today. Uh, just one other logistical thing, as far as uh, each of the speakers, uh, if you do have any questions for them as they're talking, you can type it into the Q&A field on the bottom of the screen. And uh, 
uh, either Bruce or myself or Steve Strauss will be monitoring the questions and at the end of each speaker, uh, depending on time, there will be time for, for some questions. So you can just use the Q&A field for any of that. Uh, we will see all of those. So if we don't get to your question, uh, I will review those at a later time and uh, we can get back to um, get back to people as far as any specific questions that they might have that's uh, not answered during the meeting today. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to uh, go to um, <coughs> Derek uh, James. He's, uh, I don't have uh, the info on him specifically, but he said he'll, he'll tell us where he's from and how he came here, but uh, he has currently uh, been working with Amtrak for a number of uh, of years and he will quickly go over his background and then get into the uh, presentation uh, along with um, Luke Irvine who also uh, works for um, for Amtrak. So thank you very much Gary. Uh, yeah Bruce has already unmuted me. Uh, good morning everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. Uh, I may be an unknown face for many of you. Uh, I'm actually senior manager of government affairs for Amtrak uh, in the Midwest. Uh, so my office is in Chicago uh, some of you may know uh, my counterpart, uh, Mr. Bill Hollister, who is uh, officed over at the Albany Rensselaer Station, uh, and sort of been keeping with all the changes that we saw uh, at Amtrak uh, last year. Bill uh, had soldiered with us for almost 40 years, and he took uh, a retirement as part of the uh, voluntary retirement plan. So I've been trying to dutifully fill in for Bill. Uh, but I can announce today, fortunately, I have hired a replacement for Bill, uh, and uh, that person will be starting uh, probably early next month. Uh, so uh, you guys will, uh, the New York State uh, will be get, getting the coverage that it deserves uh, as uh, one of the top states in the Amtrak network. Uh, I'm actually joined uh, today uh, by my colleague, uh, Luke Irvine. Uh, he is a road foreman of engines out of Niagara Falls. And so he and I are pinch hitting. He's a local there. I uh, lived in New York State for many years. So if I uh, flub or anything, he'll give me sort of a proverbial jab uh, and correct me. Uh, but uh, he and I will be uh, doing this presentation together. So uh, we'd love for this to, um, we want to get through this quickly, uh, uh, Bruce and I, and uh, we talked about some of the things you guys might be interested in. So what I'll do is I'll give sort of a broader overview of what's been going on with Amtrak nationally, uh, and then Luke will sort of zero in on some of the New York State stuff. So, uh, we've only been doing this for a year, so I'm going to attempt to share the screen. Let's see what we get. Okay, all right, uh, introduction's done. A uh, couple of things that we'd like to, well, five things that we'd like to go over with you today. I'm just gonna, for those folks who might be new to the organization, I'm gonna sort of go through a quick Amtrak refresher. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, the pandemic and uh, Amtrak's attempt to recover from that. Uh, the exciting stuff, uh, Amtrak's vision for how we think the network should expand and the pathway that we'll take to get there. Uh, some arguments on why it makes sense uh, to invest in passenger rail. This will give you kind of a flavor of what we, uh, the sort of things we'll be saying to public officials who will need to help us to enact or bring about uh, number three, uh, and then some other priorities that we have. Uh, again, just sort of a quick primer on Amtrak. Uh, you guys know that uh, we're a federally chartered corporation signed into existence by President Nixon. Uh, in 1970, started operations on uh, May 1st of 1971, uh, taking over the operations of more than 20 uh, private freight railroads who had been providing passenger rail service. Uh, our mission, and this is important to remember, uh, is to provide efficient and effective passenger rail mobility uh, consisting of high quality service that is trip time competitive. Uh, that's our charge. That's what we try to do uh, in, in all things. Uh, we uh, and try to do so as well with uh, an acknowledgement of the taxpayer resources that have been provided to us. We try to do that efficiently. Um, normally, in a normal year, we've been uh, receiving about $2 billion annually from the Congress. Uh, last year, of course, was an anomaly with the pandemic, uh, with the dramatic drop off in ridership uh, and corresponding drop off in revenue. Uh, we needed uh, to bulk up 
uh, with uh, some additional resources, and Congress stepped up to the plate uh, in several different um, tranches. Uh, the CARES Act last summer, the Omnibus Appropriations Act in December, and then just the other day, uh, the American Recovery Act. Uh, primarily, uh, we are funded uh, with ticket revenue, nonetheless. Uh, in a normal year, or uh, we will uh, earn uh, as much as $3 billion uh, in ticket revenue uh, to uh, top off those appropriations. If, if you guys will recall, we were expecting fiscal year 2019. The year was starting off great. We were expecting to finish that year not needing any federal operating support. Of course, uh, federal capital would always be necessary. And then of course, we've got great partners like the state of New York where we provide essential service that uh, the state uh, taxpayers were helping us, hoping to support that uh, to provide service across uh, the throughway. Uh, you guys know what we do. Uh, we brought, we're broken up into three different transportation service lines, uh, the Northeast Corridor, uh, state supported, uh, like the routes, like the Empire Service routes, uh, Empire West, Empire South, the service up uh, to uh, Plattsburgh, uh, up along Lake Champlain. Uh, and then the long distance routes, uh, which many people know us for our signature routes. Uh, plus we've got side businesses and contract commuter operations. Uh, we've got the connecting bus network, uh, some of which we interline with, others that we actually charter ourselves. And then the infrastructure business, uh, which is the majority of what's on the Northeast corridor where we own those facilities and maintain them not only for us, but for commuter operators. And then we have major stations as well. Uh, the, my home station, Chicago Union Station, we've got a huge complex here uh, that includes more than two miles of trackage along the Chicago River and a pivot yard. And then uh, as well, the Michigan line, uh, we own half of the route between Chicago and Detroit, which for those of you who are not familiar, uh, that's 288 miles uh, connecting uh, two very important American cities. Uh, the other half is actually owned by the uh, state of New York. So we've got another corridor that's almost totally within public ownership. And then, of course, the Hudson Line uh, there between Pepsi and uh, Hoffman. So uh, we consider our primary institutional customers, the federal government, states like New York, uh, the commuter railroads. Of course, our number one customers would be those who pay us to ride the train. So... Moving on into the pandemic uh, and some of its impacts, just to give you a visual, uh, a numerical visual, if you will, of how dramatic the downturn was and how the uh, pandemic affected us. If you'll, you'll see where I've circled there in the center. Uh, well, let's start over to the left at January. Uh, operating revenue was $251 million. Uh, you know, small operating loss, which is typical during the uh, off season months. We, uh, would be would have expected to be on track to earn operating profits or break even if the uh, warmer months continued and the peak travel season came. Uh, and you can see there the, the ticket revenue alone was $170 million uh, with 2.3 million riders, almost 2.4 million riders. Move over to the circle there and you can see March, April, and May, how dramatically that dropped off. Uh, from operating revenue of 251 million in January, 251 million in January down to 898 million in May. Uh, see, you see the operating loss ballooning and the ridership tanking. I mean, we were down to 10 percent of what in May of what we had in January, uh, and so that set the stage for the rest of the year. Um, as an organization, we had to scramble uh, and uh, do what we could to uh, save the organization financially. As you know, we have uh, worked in states. We've cut back on service. In the fall, we reduced long distance trains. Uh, we slimmed down uh, in terms of our employee base. Uh, we're at 16,000 employees right now. Uh, we had voluntary separations uh, like uh, my friend Bill took. And then we also had to have involuntary, to involuntary separations as well uh, to keep the organization going. Uh, we work with the appropriators on Capitol Hill, the ones putting together the uh, packages for COVID relief. And we were able to get uh, some uh, significant cash infusions uh, to get us to a pretty good point now, uh, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, some of the things that we did to, um, uh, in response to COVID uh, and in order to uh, keep the system afloat and those customers who did need to travel, give them a high level of comfort that they were traveling safe, uh, safely. Uh, you know, we, uh, on some trains, installed cleaners. Uh, we enacted enhanced uh, safety cleaning protocols, a uh, partnership with Lysol to provide us with cleaning materials. Uh, and we continued, though, to invest in the system. The dollars that uh, the Congress uh, had provided us 
allowed us to continue to uh, modernize Amtrak. Uh, new locomotives are coming. Uh, the Midwest is seeing new coaches will be introduced shortly. We've uh, invested more than $100 million last year in ADA station upgrades, so station work continues. And I know there might be some questions about some stations in upstate New York that Luke and I can talk about. Uh, you know, again, about the temporary suspensions of service uh, across New York State. Uh, we're not operating into Canada, so our communities like uh, Glen Falls and Westport and Plattsburgh don't have service because the Adirondack uh, is not running. Uh, I talked about the relief dollars uh, that Congress has provided us over the last year. Uh, uh, I, I can say, though, that as you guys have heard, I know there was a story in the Times Union the other day. Uh, President Biden signed the American Recovery Act, which provides $1.7 billion dollars uh, to Amtrak, which will allow us to restore all the long distance trains to daily uh, starting uh, May 24th. It'll be phased in over three weeks and we will be recalling all of our furloughed employees. So uh, that's great news. We're pretty happy about that. Uh, but uh, to the future. Um, also probably heard by many folks uh, is that Amtrak over the past year and a half or so has been doing some real thorough analysis of the nation. Uh, we think that uh, Congress has been showing uh, its faith in us that we are wise stewards of the taxpayer dollars, the improvements that we've been making in performance of the railroad in terms of increasing ridership, reducing our operating loss, improving the customer, customer experience. Uh, we think it's time to take passenger rail in the United States to the next level. Uh, of course, you guys know there's the original route network. Uh, some folks collect timetables. I've seen the original May 1st, 1971 timetable uh, with the map of Amtrak routes as uh, laid out by the DOT. Actually, I think this map is actually from the second timetable. The first timetable had some errors in it. Some railroads didn't join. Uh, but um, there's the route network from uh, our first year in 1971. Here's the route network today. It looks familiar because it hasn't changed very much. Of course, we've seen some a lot of subtractions, uh, trains, uh, places that used to have train service that don't have it anymore, uh, like Nashville, uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, Missoula, Montana, Las Vegas. And we've seen some uh, minor route additions, uh, primarily uh, under the sponsorship of state governments. Uh, but America in 1971, that's not how America looks today in terms of where the population is, in terms of the travel flows. And we need to think about an Amtrak network that reflects that. Uh, one of the things that we were looking at is uh, where the population is in the US today uh, and where it's growing. Uh, this map here is a representation of the population uh, spots or the high population spots across the United States. The larger the circle, the more people live there. Uh, the greener the circle, the greater the growth. Uh, yellow represents places that are growing slowly. Green represents places that are growing faster. And uh, red represents places that, have, uh, that are experiencing some population decline. Um, so you can see uh, this map here with these population centers is overlaid with the Amtrak network. Uh, for the uninitiated, pay attention to the thickness of the lines. The thicker the line on the Amtrak network, the more service we provide. Uh, so of course, the Northeast Corridor and the Empire South up to Albany, very thick lines because we provide a high level of, and frequency of service. Uh, the uh, sort of medium blue lines, uh, routes that may have two or three trains a day. And then of course, the thin gray lines are the long distance routes primarily uh, with once a day service or less. And then if you look closely, you'll see dashed lines. Those are long distance routes that are operating in the middle of uh, late at night. Our marketing studies show that the uptake of customers for trains that arrive in the middle of the light, night is much, much lower than that trains arrive in the daytime. Humans are odd, odd creatures. They like to sleep at night. So uh, obviously we think that we need to be expanding the network to the places where people live. Uh, and we know that the sweet spot Passenger rail is in corridors of 100 to 400 miles. That's where we think we can compete effectively with the automobile and with the airplane, the other two major modes of transit. When we talk to public officials, we remind them on why investments in passenger rail make sense. 
Uh, we show them this map here of what we expect congestion to be on the American highway system in 2045. Uh, if you'll recall, you can see the heavy red is where you're going to see a congested network. They tend to overlap uh, with where you saw the population centers. So travel between cities like Dallas-Fort Worth and Houston, uh, that corridor, which is a four-hour drive today along, I think it's I-45, not going to be so pleasant. Uh, I've driven between LA and Las Vegas. That's already not pleasant. So uh, we think that, again, passenger rail can provide a solution uh, to uh, policymakers uh, to pro provide increased mobility and address things like climate change. Uh, oftentimes, I work with a lot of uh, legislators who are concerned about uh, not just that uh, trains are great to ride, but that trains provide uh, Use, if you will, to the business, to the business community, tourism, uh, business travel. Uh, we think that the benefits of passenger rail are myriad. Um, multimodal connectivity, uh, connecting with local transit systems, uh, micro mobility like uh, bicycles and uh, uh, shared ride services. Having a, a passenger rail station in communities is like having a highway interchange uh, riding your downtown without all of the attendant negatives. Uh, accessibility is important, especially for a lot of uh, rural communities, like in my part of the country, the airlines have uh, scaled back a lot on service to smaller cities that had had more robust service. Uh, entire airports, which had been hubs, like Cleveland and Cincinnati and St. Louis, are seeing see a lot less um, flight flexibility uh, as there has been airline consolidation. So we're seeing a much greater interest by even mid-sized cities in the rail that passenger rail can play mobility, uh, and on and on. So uh, we think that the case to be made for passenger rail uh, is a solid case. So in terms of reauthorization, uh, many of you may know that about every five or six years or so, Congress reauthorizes the surface transportation bill. Uh, this last bill, uh, the one that's current now, is called the FAST Act, the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act. It sets the framework for distribution of gas taxes and money to transit, but it also sets the rules of the game for passenger rail, including Amtrak. So which grant programs are out there, how much money they're going to get, and uh, how much money that Amtrak is gonna get over the term of the authorization. Well, the FAST Act uh, is about to expire. It actually expired last fall, but Congress extended it uh, through this October. So it needs to be reauthorized. Uh, as a key player, we think in the nation's transportation system, Amtrak is going to be submitting our ideas for how we think the surface transportation bill should change. So our priorities that we set forth or that are our guiding principles in terms of our reauthorization proposal are to continue to have the system recover, uh, make sure to provide us with the tools to keep the system in place, to continue to invest in it because we think once the economy is back fully and Americans are traveling uh, for the reasons I stated before, rail is really the mode that we should be investing in. Uh, we'd like to see a long-range, multi-year reliable funding uh, for passenger rail, uh, possibly a passenger rail trust fund, uh, flexibility for localities to invest in passenger rail, and we'd like to be authorized uh, at uh, pretty robust uh, expenditures for our capital needs. We also want to see the FRA grant programs like the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvement Grants uh, and the Restoration Enhancement Grants fully funded. Uh, and we'd like the Surface Transportation Board uh, to be bulked up so that it has the resources to be able to uh, manage uh, disputes uh, and relations between railroads, especially between Amtrak and the host railroads. Uh, we want to strengthen our partnership with the states, Federal Railroad, and with uh, the communities we serve. Uh, we want to be able to invest in our fleet, uh, continue to invest in stations. And key to all of this is we want to be able to grow the network. Uh, we want to see corridor growth. Uh, we want to see improvements to the long distance network and possibly some long distance growth as well. Uh, we know about the uh, chronic problem of chronic underinvestment in Amtrak. Uh, this graph here, hopefully all of you, nobody here is colorblind, but you can see at the bottom, the sort of aqua teal, uh, sort of the level of Amtrak grants over the last 10 years at the bottom relative to the other travel modes, water, mass transit, aviation, and of course at the top, uh, highways. So uh, the key, key piece of our uh, reauthorization proposal is that we want to grow the network and we want to improve the network that we now have right now. 
We think, again, passenger rail sweet spot is those corridors between 100 and 400 miles. We think that they can be competitive, that we can provide quality service that's frequent uh, and on time, that we can capture a lot of market share, just like we have on corridors where we are already doing this. So we're seeking a new and expanded partnership with the states and for the FRA to provide us with the funds to be able to step in, work with the states, and actually provide all of the capital funding up front and the operating subsidy for the first five years for more than 30 corridors around the country, new corridors, and then bulking up the service on more than 20 corridors that already exist. Uh, we're going to be asking in this surface transportation reauthorization for $25 billion. Uh, that's $5 billion a year over the term of the bill. Uh, that would be an increase from the $2 billion that they've given us in a normal year over the past couple of years. Uh, that will fund uh, the upgrades that are necessary on our host railroads. We know that uh, we have a very successful and profitable freight railroad network in the United States. We want to keep it that way. Having a healthy freight railroad network means you can have a healthy passenger rail network. But we also know that there are conflicts, and so we want to come to the table when working with the host railroads on network expansion with the dollars that are necessary to um, put in place reasonable expansions on their network to be able to accommodate passenger trains. We also want to use those dollars uh, to fund new fleet acquisitions. Uh, with the dramatic expansion that we're looking to see, we're going to need new passenger cars, new locomotives, upgraded and expanded stations. And so we think this is a down payment on getting the U.S. the passenger rail system it deserves. Uh, there are some uh, corridors that we would like to see developed. Uh, uh, of course, in the Midwest, uh, my home state, uh, Chicago being a major city in the U.S. with connections to regions across the Midwest. Uh, right now, we will run one train a day between Chicago and the Twin Cities. Uh, we, we, we think that should be doubled initially. Uh, we are in the process of uh, trying to add service along the Gulf Coast. Uh, Chicago and Detroit. We, uh, of course, out in your neck of the woods, we want to see the Ethan Allen Express uh, extended up to Burlington. Uh, we want to increase the number of frequencies on our very popular Hiawatha service uh, with seven round trips a day between Chicago and Milwaukee. We want to take that up to 10. Uh, you may not know the Hiawathas. Uh, again, CP is our host and CP is our best railroad. Those Hiawathas run on time more than 95% of the time. It's actually the best in the of course, we've got uh, planned pretty dramatic expansions uh, in Virginia. Virginia has really stepped out, stepped up uh, in terms of their investment in passenger rail. Uh, other new corridors uh, that we are would like to see implemented: uh, the Front Range corridor uh, between uh, Cheyenne uh, through Denver and down through uh, Colorado Springs to Pueblo, also serving Boulder and uh, Fort Collins. Uh, Phoenix, fifth largest city in America, has no Amtrak service. Uh, it should be connected with several trains a day to Los Angeles, America's second largest city. Uh, and of course, uh, a hub at Atlanta makes sense with service up to Charlotte, over to Nashville, uh, and also here in the Midwest, uh, connecting the three C's and a D, Cleveland, Columbus, Dayton, and Cincinnati. Dayton's not on the map, but I've talked to the mayor of Dayton a lot. I promised her that I would always refer to that as three C's and a D. So... Uh, so again, we'll, we also uh, will seek authority to uh, advance some corridors where we may not have state participation, corridors that make a lot of sense. One of the reasons that we want to see these changes is because under the present uh, regime, the states have to take the lead in corridor development. Uh, all states don't have the uh, expertise or necessarily the political will uh, to step up with a lot of dollars up front. So that's why we want to be able to and we want the surface transportation reauthorization to give us that ability. Long distance is also important to us. Uh, we, uh, in order for that long distance service to uh, continue to be relevant and be popular, uh, we've got new locomotives that are on order. We want to use these dollars from the reauthorization to refleet. Uh, the superliners are getting up there in age. I mean, I remember as a kid when the superliners were introduced, uh, Amtrak had something called Family Days, where they brought the train to um, these, super, these new superliner cars in the 70s, and you could ride them for $5 out to a place called Kensington and back, and I was just so excited. So it's kind of uh, shocking that now it's time for them to retire, but I'm not ready to retire. So, um, yeah, it's time for them to time for them to go and we need to replace them. 
but real key to uh, the success of the long distance network is having trains that run on time. And this is our division of the network that suffers the most from freight train interference. Uh, we have uh, great freight railroad partners and then we have those who are not so great. Uh, we need to be provided with the tools uh, to um, enforce the preference that is by law do passenger trains. Uh, we want the STB to be able to rule quickly on disputes between Amtrak and host railroads, and we want to be able to as well uh, address their failings uh, in the court system, which we are not allowed to do at this time. So we'll be seeking that that assistance as well to improve on this. And of course, our bread and butter, the Northeast Corridor, uh, we'll use the dollars to uh, continue to uh, make the capital investments necessary to uh, make that uh, the world-class railroad, which it should be connecting, you know, really the heart and soul of the American economy. I'm a Midwesterner, I'm a Chicago partisan, but I love New York and I know how important New York and the East Gateway is to uh, the American economy. Uh, we've got projects that we've got to move forward, a gateway, portal bridge, uh, East River tunnels, uh, the BMP tunnel uh, by Baltimore, the Susquehanna River Bridge, the Connecticut River Bridge, all those are going to be projects that need multi-year funding uh, to advance uh, those projects. So uh, part of the reauthorization proposal. Other things that we pay attention to uh, and will also need to be addressed, continued safety and security, uh, making sure that the police department has the tools and the technology that it needs to uh, keep us uh, nation traveling safely. Uh, we continue to invest to bring the uh, railroad into compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, station projects all over, uh, platform reconstructions, accessible pathways, uh, and then rolling in state of good repair improvements to make sure that our uh, front door to our communities uh, remains or becomes even more pleasant. Uh, you know, high-speed rail, uh, you know, in addition to our seller program, uh, we're working with several states for speed increases. Uh, in my territory, uh, we expect in the next couple of months to be increasing more trackage to 110 miles per hour on the Chicago to Detroit corridor uh, and to 90 miles per hour between Chicago and St. Louis. Uh, I mentioned how we want the FRA grant programs to be fully funded uh, and a lot of back of the house stuff is happening too in terms of um, uh, technology. You're going to see new kiosks uh, starting to roll out to replace the outdated quick pack machines. Uh, on the right here is a picture that I love. Uh, these are the new Siemens Venture Coaches uh, which are being rolled out uh, on all of the hub on all of the routes that hub out of Chicago. Uh, so we've got 88 coaches that will be replacing the Anthony and the Horizon cars that we use. Uh, much, much bigger windows, uh, wider aisles. The, uh, the restrooms are commodious. Uh, because we operate on mostly freight railroads, uh, these cars have wheelchair lifts built, to them, built into them, and each coach will have three bike racks. So uh, we expect these to be very customer uh, pleasing uh, next month. Uh, we're going to start rolling these out on our Abraham Lincoln service between Chicago and St. Louis. So that's good stuff coming. So what we need, we need the public. We need you guys to weigh in on our behalf. Uh, later this month or early in April, we are going to be releasing our reauthorization proposal to the Congress. Uh, and we want uh, to have your voices, uh, the voices of your public officials, both on the state level, uh, to weigh in with your congressional delegation. That means Senator Schum Schumer, Senator uh, uh, Gillenbrand, and your congressional delegation to let them know that you think investments in passenger rail make sense for New York State. It makes sense for America. It's time for us to stand up a passenger train system that can compete with the best and that can really serve as the a, a solid third leg uh, in the uh, nation's transportation system. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague. I know uh, Bruce and Gary, you guys have him at a specific time. Uh, I guess I used, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you on how you guys wanna handle this. I can take questions now or Luke can go and then we can take questions out. So it's up to you. Uh, Luke, why don't you go ahead, please? Yeah. Okay, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you uh, folks this morning. Uh, my name is Luke Irvine. I am the road foreman of engines uh, for Amtrak. I am based out of Niagara Falls in Buffalo, New York. Uh, just a little bit about me really quick. Um, I've been with Amtrak for about seven years in June. And before that, I was with uh, CSX uh, 
for almost a decade. Um, I supervise the operation in close concert with a team of uh, dedicated managers in Albany, and I uh, supervise specifically between Syracuse and Niagara Falls, and uh, more specifically, uh, the train and engine service employees that run the services between those two points. Okay, uh, so uh, we'll get going with our Empire Service Overview here. Uh, next slide, please, Derek. Uh, just a quick view here of our Empire Service. Uh, based in Albany, our team oversees uh, operations between Erie, Pennsylvania, and uh, New York's Penn Station, uh, and various points in between. Next slide. And uh, this is just a breakdown here of the routes uh, we serve here. Uh, you know, it's over a thousand miles here, and uh, obviously, as everybody probably is well aware here, we have not been to uh, Montreal Rutland or Toronto here uh, since uh, COVID-19 and uh, the pandemic began. Um, we are operating the Lakeshore Limited here uh, three days a week between Albany and Boston. And uh, I'm not sure if Derek mentioned it or not, but uh, obviously some really good news here uh, coming out uh, the last uh, week or so, uh, indicating that we'll be restarting seven day a week uh, Lakeshore Limited service here uh, around Memorial Day. Uh, for those of you that are interested, um, we have maintained crew qualifications uh, between Rouse's Point. Uh, we cannot get into Canada to uh, go up to Montreal to maintain those qualifications uh, right now, but we have maintained those crew qualifications between Montreal and Rutland. So uh, we are hoping that in the near future, uh, we'll be able to resume that service. Uh, next slide. As you can see up there, uh, we are only operating uh, about 18 to uh, 22 trains a day uh, currently. Uh, that's down by about six to 10 trains per day, depending on the day of the week uh, due to the pandemic. Um, one of the big things that we've started here and uh, we are placing an emphasis on, uh, especially here in Albany, is uh, customer on-time performance, which is a relatively new metric that uh, doesn't focus on endpoint on-time arrivals. It actually focuses on uh, on-time performance between stations uh, on an individual customer basis. Uh, as you can see, we set our target for fiscal year 21 at approximately 78%, and we are doing about four percentage points better than that on average. Next slide. And uh, the on-time performance by route uh, is uh, actually measured uh, you know, by uh, customer feedback and uh, passengers letting us know how we're doing. Uh, we do get uh, almost nine out of 10 points there uh, as far as their satisfaction goes with that on time performance, which is uh, pretty, uh, you know, pretty positive news and, and we're happy with that. And, you know, we just hope that we can continue improving that uh, over the uh, coming months. Next slide. And this is the graph that uh, nobody uh, likes to see here, but um, as you can see, and Derek mentioned earlier there, uh, obviously you can see that we have that uh, gigantic drop there in passenger uh, ridership levels uh, about a year ago right now. I uh, can't believe we're a year into this. Um, the good news is, is that our executive leadership team does uh, see a continuously improving trend of uh, ticket sales. And we are hoping that uh, by the end of this fiscal year, we will have reached uh, a growth uh, or a recovery, I should say, uh, to about 50% of uh, what our ridership was pre-COVID. Next slide. This is uh, the most interesting slide for me, in my opinion. Um, you know, everybody always thinks that, uh, you know, everybody thinks Amtrak and they think Hudson Line, they think Northeast Corridor, et cetera. Uh, the interesting part about uh, COVID-19 and the ridership and the statistics here that we're demonstrating uh, in front of you right now are the fact that, as you can see, you know, outside of Albany and New York, your busiest stations remain Hudson, New York, Rhinecliff, New York. But the interesting part is uh, when you look to Western New York, um, I can tell you that, uh, you know, from a personal uh viewpoint. Um, the ridership here in Western New York is very encouraging, especially in the middle of a pandemic. As you can see on the westbound train, some of the busiest stations uh, outside of the ones I mentioned before are uh, between Syracuse and Buffalo Exchange Street, which is really taking off uh, with the uh, introduction and opening of our new station downtown. Next slide. And uh, just to further support that uh, information there that we demonstrated in the last slide, as you can see, uh, the most uh, uh, the busiest trains, I should say, are actually the trains that do operate to and from Niagara Falls. Uh, your 281, 283 westbound that originate out of New York's Penn Station. And, uh, of course, the eastbounds that we're running, uh, 284 and 64 right now. Uh, 64 originating in Niagara Falls. 
Of course, uh, once again, you guys are all aware that we're not operating 280 and 63 right now. But uh, once again, uh, we're hoping that uh, as we uh, recover from this pandemic, we are hoping that uh, those trains will return soon. Next slide. Uh, another uh, good thing that uh, we are uh, measuring here and, uh, you know, another good news story. Uh, we like good news stories here at Amtrak. Uh, our customer satisfaction score is uh, actually trending uh, over five percentage points higher than our goal. Um, obviously, we're always trying to improve that. Um, our target's 81% right now and uh, our fiscal year to date score is about 86%. Next slide. And of course, as you guys are all well aware, uh, we are, uh, I should say, uh, this, uh, with uh, the help of New York State and, you know, advocacy groups such as yours, uh, we are uh, seeing a lot of improvements here between uh, Albany and uh, Niagara Falls. Uh, you guys are all well aware of the stations that have opened here in the last few years, uh, Niagara Falls, uh, Schenectady, Rochester, etc. Um, our current uh, crown jewel and exciting uh, opening here is the new downtown Buffalo station at Exchange Street, which is a uh, a really beautiful station. Um, Albany is uh, soon to get some improvements inside the station. Uh, mostly that's going to uh, boil down to uh, ticket office relocation and improved passenger flow to and from the platforms. Uh, other projects that I, we are working on right now are some uh, temporary improvements to the station at Rhinecliffe on the Hudson Line. And the station at Buffalo Depew is supposed to be getting a platform makeover here this year. Um, I know that uh, there's uh, going to be somebody speaking here from the state of Vermont, but uh, we are excited to uh, hopefully begin service to Burlington with the Ethan Allen. Uh, I know it was scheduled here uh, in 2021, uh, but for obvious reasons, uh, we're aiming for 2022 at this time. And uh, I believe that's it, Derek. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, back to you, Bruce. Okay. Um, actually, back to Gary. Oh, I Gary. Guess. Gary yes. Sorry. Hello. So, uh, Yes, thank you for the uh, update in the Empire Quarter. Um, uh, Luke, once again, Luke was a road foreman of engines uh, for Amtrak in the Empire Quarter stationed to Niagara Falls, and Derek James, the senior manager of government affairs of uh, Amtrak. And I must say, uh, if you do see Bill Hollister, just give us our thanks. He uh, was certainly somebody that uh, believed in improving the uh, service on the train, and I ran into him on the train a number of times and uh, he was always like, you know, what can we do better? Uh, you know, is the bathroom, are you in the bathroom? Is the bathroom okay? And he would always be asking questions, trying to improve the customer service on the train and also in the station. So uh, uh, that's very good that uh, he's enjoying his retirement. And uh, I must say getting out just before COVID was certainly quite the uh, interesting timing on his part. So um, I think Bruce is monitoring the question and answers. So I guess, uh, that we'll do the question and answers both to uh, Derek and Luke and whatever, whoever kind of has the answer, depending on whether it's specific to the Empire Corridor or not, I guess we'll determine who takes it. So uh, I All guess right. I'll pass it over to Bruce for the, any uh, pertinent questions in the Q&A field right now. Uh, hey, Gary, let me just, let me just say, wait, we wait, also wait, have Matt on. So Derek, you oh. want to talk about Matt, please? Yeah, I was going to oh, say, okay. that's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, we're also <laughs> joined by my colleague, Matt Losi. He's a train master out of Rensselaer. So. Uh, you've got a trifecta. If, if one of us can't answer the question, it's a question that doesn't deserve to be asked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bruce. So over to you for. Uh, we we have a couple of minutes here. Uh, probably the top question is about the Adirondack and its potential uh, reinstatement, uh, <laughs> which we uh, understand certainly is to contingent upon the border reopening. Uh, as would be the Maple Leaf uh, being the, the joint service with VIA going to Toronto. Uh, however, though, certainly some of our members are interested whether there's going to be any possibility of potentially running the Adirondack as far as, say, Plattsburgh uh, before the border reopens. I can, well, I can, I think I can address the issue with the border. I mean, it sounds like your folks realize that, yeah, it's contingent upon uh, what the Canadians decide to do, what the U.S. and the Canadians decide to do in terms of opening the border. Uh, with the uh, Maple Leaf, uh, that's also contingent upon uh, what VIA decides to do because technically, you know, that's a VIA train once it crosses the border there. So uh, with regard, I know that they're out on the West Coast. We've been doing some um, qualifying runs uh, to get the crews back ready uh, once service is resumed between Seattle and Vancouver. 
Uh, we've uh, worked out a deal with the Customs and Border Protection that they can ride up on the train uh, to Vancouver, and then the train turns around, but they can't get off the train. Um, I think there are some more complicating issues uh, over here uh, in um, uh, at the crossing uh, at uh, Rouse's Point, uh, having to do with uh, CN uh, that we've got to negotiate through on that. Uh, if Matt or um, or Luke, you guys want to add anything to that, please feel free. Yeah, in regards to the uh, Adirondack service, you know, most of our ridership was uh, point to point New York to Montreal, so that's a factor. It was looked at uh, in the interim of whether that would be feasible to run service just up to the border. Uh, but the majority of riders before COVID went from New York to Montreal and vice versa. And when you factor in the reduction, it would be very few people on the train um, riding to the intermediate points. You know, that being said, we're happy we did do the refamiliarization trip recently for our crews. So when that does come back, uh, we can move relatively quickly to get that restored uh, from the operational standpoint. Yeah, to Matt's point, you know, when these trains aren't performed, when they're not carrying a lot of folks, that means the operating loss goes up. Uh, and so the states have had to deal with uh, challenges for their revenues. And so they're looking for ways to preserve the service, uh, yet also uh, preserve their resources that have been appropriated to them. I mean, states all across the country that we contract with have cut back on train service uh, because the ridership just isn't there. And if the trains are running and we're driving, we're, 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 we're spending money, yet there aren't any customers, the states would have to pick that up. So. Thanks, Matt. Hey, Bruce, okay. Next, next question. Uh, it, most of the questions revolved around that that came in. So uh, I've answered some others that I, I was able to answer independently. Uh, so for the sake of time, uh, we should probably, well, we have a couple more minutes. I'm sorry. Yeah, we have a couple more minutes. I have a question yeah. then, Bruce. Please go uh, ahead, Gary. Um, I was recently, uh, only because I had, my dentist is located right near the, uh, Rhinecliff train station and I just stopped in there and I had noticed that the, uh, platform and steps had all kinds of braces and concrete and even unevenness to it. And I was just wondering, you had mentioned that earlier, what, I was just wondering what kind of scope are you looking at? Because certainly uh, as ridership comes back, that station certainly needs some improvements. I was just wondering if you, how far along you are or what you're kind of looking at in at the Rhinecliff station, which as you pointed out, is a very busy station on the Empire Corridor. Hey, so I still have a couple of slides on that. I'm sorry, what's that? No, I'm wondering, do I still have the ability to share the screen? Absolutely. Go ahead, oh, Derek. Yes. All right. So, let's see. All right, Rhinecliff, which I'm understanding Rhinecliff is the second busiest station in upstate New York, if you consider Rhinecliff upstate, third busiest station in the state, because there is that place down and um, at the opening of the Hudson River, that's the busiest station in the whole system. Uh, I Ryan can assure you, Derek, that Rhinecliff is downstate when you live in Buffalo. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> When you live in Westchester County, where I am, it's upstate, though. So, <laughs> so uh, the customers who board us at Rhinecliff, their money is green, so we don't care where they are. Right. <laughs> so uh, we, we do have a project uh, that is advancing at Rhinecliff. Uh, we're in uh, the design phase right now. Uh, what is anticipated and what we're planning to do at Rhinecliff is we're going to uh, construct a 600 foot long, 48 inch high level center island platform, uh, two new elevators, uh, an accessible bathroom and ticket counter upgrades within the building. Uh, walkways are gonna be made compliant throughout the building. Uh, we're going to be upgrading all the parking lots. There's the north parking, the mid-level parking, the south parking. They'll be paved. They'll be fenced. They'll be lighted. Uh, we uh, and with new drainage, uh, the windows uh, will be uh, repaired, including the sills. We're going to be putting in all new doors and thresholds. Uh, the stairs that you talked about, we're going to be repairing the concrete stairs that are outside the building and the staircases that go down to the platform. Those will be fixed as well. And the roof that we're going to do is going to have a uh, matching Spanish tile. You can see in the image on the right there, uh, it's a uh, distinctive tile uh, that we're going to match that. 
Uh, right now, uh, there's track work that ha is going on that uh, is important to the project. That's going to be completed uh, in fiscal year 22, and then we'll begin the actual construction on the station in 23. Uh, I think I've got some photos here. Uh, there is the an overview. You can see Ryan Cliff is in the upper center right of the actual building itself. Uh, with the uh, tracks being accessed by an overhead walkway uh, with stairs going down to the center island platform. Uh, here are some images of some of the components of the station which we will be addressing. Uh, walkways, uh, doorways, uh, there are the concrete stairs. Uh, uh, and uh, you can see there in the center uh, top, actually all of these are uh, platform images. Uh, the platform is uh, down below top of rail. Uh, we're going to turn that into uh, a 48 inch uh, level boarding platform. So all doors will be able to open uh, and reduce the dwell time there at the station. You can see the elevator there that's going to be replaced. So uh, exciting things coming for Ryan Cliff. Uh, we've had some hiccups in terms of negotiations with one of the property owners nearby uh, and parking. Uh, we've worked through that uh, with them and with the community. So exciting times. Uh, I look forward to uh, getting out there for the ribbon cutting. Even if I'm not the government affairs person to New York, I am coming. Does that answer your question? Yes, that's, uh, that's fantastic news. Uh, that you basically, I think, just about listed uh, everything that I had uh, written down and noticed needed to be done there. So that's, uh, I knew they were looking doing something there, but that's good to hear that that's a pretty comprehensive uh, amount of work to be done there which sounds fantastic for for uh, the passengers especially going forward as we gradually get out of the pandemic so uh, there's another question Gary uh, coming in are there plans to accommodate bicycles on Empire service and I know I can answer that question that yes bicycle service is available on all trains is that not correct Matt it is correct I was just typing the answer to it but yeah. I'll say it out loud here um, there's a twenty dollar accommodation charge. Um, the Amfleet One coaches, so any train without check baggage, can now accommodate carry on bicycle service. Uh, the rear wheel has to be removed by the passenger, and it can be stowed in the luggage rack, which has been modified um, at the end of the coach. So that is currently available, and people have been using it. And um, I believe that three per train can be accommodated. It's it's in the inventory on uh, Amtrak.com and on Aero. Uh, based on every train. So if you see a bicycle available, you can carry that on and uh, stow it uh, right in the coach. So the key, when you the, make the, your the reservation, key. that's yeah. one of the options you're presented with. You can bring your pets on the train or you can bring your bike on the train. So anytime you make a reservation, uh, you're given that uh, ability to uh, choose that if you wish. And your golf clubs. And <laughs> skis, Derek. I've seen skis on the Adirondack. Certainly. Okay. Anything still else, have, Gary, in your end? Uh, I don't really see anything. We still have three or four minutes. I don't know if Jim is on yet. Not yet. No, yes, he said he could, was going to come on right at 12 o'clock. So we still have a, about another two or three minutes if anybody has any, que any Amtrak-related questions. Um, so if nobody has anything else, uh, I can always bring up the Syracuse platform. I know that's been an issue with the boarding and the plates because of the separation there. Is there any project to temper to uh, at least in the short term uh, solve the uh, platform issue at Syracuse? Um, okay, who wants to take that? Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. It's a hot Go potato, ahead, huh? Yeah. I, I can jump in there a little bit on that. Um, I, you know, I don't really have a lot of details, but I do know that uh, it is very much on our radar. And I don't know exactly what the timeline is for those improvements, but I know that it's uh, very much on our list of things to do. And we are looking at uh, options here on uh, repairing that uh, long term. Yeah, what uh, he said. I, <laughs> I know that uh, the state is very interested in what will go on at Syracuse also in the longer view. 
Uh, yes, it which is. Which affects both near term and longer term changes at Syracuse. Right. And it is a little bit of a choke point for us, too. Uh, as you guys are well aware, uh, there are a couple of times a day, uh, you know, pre COVID with a full schedule, of course, where we actually have uh, trains that are actually meeting there. And of course, we can only accommodate one train at a time on the platform. So um, I think that there's a multitude of different options being looked at. And uh, as soon as we have details on those, uh, I'm sure they'll be shared with you. Great. Gary? Um, I don't think I see anything else. You see anything else, Bruce, or any uh, other no. questions? No, I'm trying to manage this one. I don't see anything <laughs> offhand. I would say we should thank our uh, guests for uh, participating with us this morning. We appreciate you taking your time on a Saturday. Go ahead, Gary. Yes, thank you, Derek. Thank you, Luke. And uh, thank you, Matt, who I wasn't aware was coming on, but I think I had met you once or twice at Kevin's office uh, for uh, something in, a, in the recent past before COVID. But uh, thanks a lot for joining. You guys can stay on and listen to uh, Jim Matthews from the Rail Passengers Association, or you can go back and enjoy your uh, Saturday day. But thanks a lot for spending the last hour with us and providing us an update on everything that Amtrak's looking at and and uh, in and uh, extra service and various things that are being done on the Empire Corridor, along with the uh, ridership and things that are current. That was a very informative presentation. As somebody uses Rhinecliff, I especially like the. Uh, the uh, page on uh, the improvements to Rhinecliff. But uh, thanks a lot for uh, taking an hour out of your Saturday. And uh, then Bruce will just hook in uh, Jim Matthews in the next two or three minutes, and then we'll go to uh, Jim Matthews in about two or three minutes. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, very thank you, guys. It. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Luke, for helping me out. Yep, no, thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. Thanks, Matt. All right.